intellectual property and copyright law, which is where I come in. Dave? Uh, hi, I'm Dave Hansen. I'm uh, executive director of the Authors Alliance, a nonprofit that supports authors who want to see their works widely disseminated and uh, who want to support access to knowledge. Um, and we mostly work on kind of the same stuff, information policy, copyright. Uh, I spend a lot of Friday nights thinking about fair use. <laughs> I'm Courtney Lytle. I am a local attorney. I'm a partner at Culhane Meadows, doing mostly intellectual property work, also some run-of-the-mill commercial stuff. I teach a lot of different intellectual property classes at Emory Law School. So I think I'm holding down the academic side of the discussion. Great. So, Warhol v. Goldsmith. Uh, this is a case which, if you ask uh, pretty much any attorney who, who does copyright policy, you're going to get a, huh. Uh, response out of them. Uh, it's, it's, I don't even want to say polarizing, it's just sort of head-scratching for a lot of folks. Um, so we're going to walk through why that is and then make sure we leave plenty of time open at the end for questions, uh, some of which we may not be able to answer, uh, for the runes have been cast and we're not entirely sure what the Supreme Court was thinking. Um, now, the, the factual background on how this goes, and this is a simplified version, um, but they're obviously show of hands who knows who Andy Warhol is okay good I don't have to explain Andy Warhol because that would hurt my soul um because Andy Warhol kind of hurts my soul not gonna lie um so so you have Andy Warhol who does these famous silkscreen prints um and you have uh Lynn Goldsmith who is a photographer and she photographs rock stars she photographs famous people she does I think she also does a lot of concert photography mm -hmm. um active very active in the 80s she took a, uh, a very, um, she took a portrait of Prince, the artist. Uh, and this went into a licensing pool, which is so, so for the way magazines license their images to put in various and sundry articles is they basically have a pool of like images that they can pull from and they pay the licensing fee and they go and like, what, you know, what pictures of Prince do we have? So she took this photo, put it in, Vanity Fair used it to uh, accompany an article on Prince. They paid the licensing fee for it. That was in like 1980, something, eight, something like that. Um, if I put my glasses on, I can tell you. And uh, fast forward to Prince passing away uh, relatively recently, the last few years. Um, and Vanity Fair was like, hmm, we really want to run another story about Prince. Now, in the interim, Andy Warhol had seen this, this Goldsmith photo and thought, hmm, I'm going to make some silkscreen prints of this. Now, he uh, went through and proceeded to make 12 different silkscreens. Now, he obtained a license to, to use the Goldsmith photo for one of them, which I believe was... The one they used in the magazine. Was it? Yeah. Okay. So it was the one they used in the magazine. Um, anyway, he obtained a license for one of them. Uh, he then proceeded to make like 12 others, which he didn't tell anybody about, really. Um, and they then went through and I believe after Prince passed away, ran a memorial issue in Vanity Fair and they, they used the other unlicensed Prince prints. Well, they went back to the foundation because Warhol was dead by then, too. Right. And they said, hey... Remember that thing we used of yours? They totally forgot the photographer existed. They went back to the Warhol folks and said, can we use that again? They said, oh, well, which one? At which point they said, what do you mean, which one? We got a whole stack of them here. And they chose right. a different one right. for That had not paid the licensing fee. Right. Um, yeah, the, the wording around the Prince Prince is going to get, sorry, in advance. Um, I will, I will shamelessly plug my own blog about this, which is titled Prince Prince uh, in Multiple Tints and Article 3's Art Critics Tints. Um, <laughs> We Bob, and, on Bob Loblaw's Law, Law, Law Blog. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so uh, Goldsmith, who was utterly unaware that this other set of 11 or 12, whatever these other prints were, had been made, uh, saw all of a sudden this new Warhol screen on the cover of Vanity Fair, was like, hang on a gosh darn minute, uh, and brought a lawsuit against the Andy Warhol Foundation, which is where I kick it over to Courtney. And I'm going to be picky because it matters in some of the analysis, at least on my what I think of with it. She didn't actually sue. She sent them. A, she sent a letter to Vanity Fair saying, or no, to the foundation saying, "Hey, I can't help but notice that there's a new one of these." And she got paid, I think, 500 bucks for the first one on a licensing fee. Vanity Fair hired Warhol for like 10k. 
So the money is not equivalent. And she said, I can't help but notice this is different. And they said, oh, and they sued her. So she, my guess, since this is where, at this level is where I would have been involved, the client would say, hey, that's my thing. And we, I would say, well, you know, that's pretty clear that they needed to pay you for that one too. Let me just send a letter and they'll send you a check. I would have been, I believe the technical term is gobsmacked when their response was a lawsuit. Because for 500 bucks, maybe double that now that it's been later, um, they and could have made this go away. Were they seeking declaratory judgment that this was, okay, so yeah, yeah. so the Warhol Foundation, when you, you can file a lawsuit that basically just asks the court to say like, please officially declare that this is not an infringement, this thing that we did. And so that was what the, the basis of the original lawsuit was. And that didn't go great for them. Yeah, nope. it got to the Supreme Court, which, uh, as I, I, in earlier panels I've pointed out, I'm a transactional lawyer. I try to avoid fights rather than fight them in court. And I, that's why, like I said, it would seem like a very easy dispute to settle. You paid me to use my picture before. You seem to have done it again and forgot the asking permission part, but that's cool. Just, you know, I do this for a living. And instead they said, no, we're going to have to kill you. <laughs> and... <laughs> I would have been taken aback by what seemed like unnecessary violence. But again, I'm not a litigator. I see it differently than some folks. But the, so it did not indeed go terribly well for them. Because again, if you think about how cheap it would have been to say, oh gosh, sorry, here's a check. Um, what they wouldn't have gotten was the ability to use 18 other of the prints they have done. But they still don't have that because the opinion is limited only to this one print and oddly, this one use of this one print. I'll explain why that's weird to us um, in a second. We, we're going to start with a slight overview of the law because once we start talking about it, we forget that normal humans don't actually not only stay up on Friday nights, but stay awake at night thinking about this. And we're off to the races. <laughs> and there we go. Yeah, it's over at that point. And yeah. Uh, my, my family, for instance, is not even in this room because they've heard this before. They don't want to hear it again. I talk a lot. But so, um, fair use. Most people are familiar with fair use. It's an affirmative defense to an action for infringement. So yes, I used your, I used your work, but I'm allowed to. The law says so. Well, what are the rules for when I can use it? A lot of us were hoping this case would give us a better idea. The statute tells us very clearly there are four factors and you weigh these four factors. There's no mathematical equation to it. We're lawyers, we don't like math, but we, we weigh them. So you take these four things, you see what seems important, and from there, you remember to silence your phone since you're on a panel, sorry. Um, yep. And from there, you kind of do this equitable balancing thing of the four elements. The first element is the purpose and use of the um, work. The second element is, I always get them in the wrong order. The second element is the nature of the copyrighted work. When we're talking about the first element, that's really all the opinion talks about, which if you remember I said we balance these four things to come to an answer. How can I balance them and come to an answer if I only talk about one? Okay. Um, but there are four. The first one is the purpose and character of the use. There are traditionally a couple of different aspects to that. One is whether it is a commercial or a non-commercial use. A lot of non-lawyers think that's it. If you're not selling it, if your use is non-commercial, it is a fair use. No. You can have a non-commercial infringement. So, but commercial, non-commercial does matter because if you're using the work in an infringing f or in a commercial fashion, it seems less fair. And by fair, we actually mean fair like we would use the word in English, not just the way lawyers use it. The statute also gives us some examples of the kinds of uses that are meant to be allowed. Criticism, news reporting, education, things like that. If you're an art student, you should be able to copy great works of art to practice your art. If you, um, you're writing an article about a novel, you should be able to talk about the novel. Nothing in the statute refers to whether you have to write spoiler alert at the beginning or not. But, you have, but if you want to quote excerpts in the course of a review, within reason, balancing, you can do that. If you are in a classroom 
and you want to use pictures of this artwork or if you want to use pieces of articles and other things in the classroom, you can do that. That's not, the way that they look at it when they were drafting the statute is that that doesn't really compete. We're trying to protect the author's work and the author's right to exploit that work for a limited period of time. And this doesn't really conflict with that because you know you, teachers don't have to pay a license fee to be able to talk about something. So we go for, that's our first element. Along the way, the idea of transformative use became part of the first element. If you've heard anything other than commercial, non-commercial about fair use, it's transformative. This is something that both my family and my students have had to hear me rant about for lo these many decades. Transformative does occur in the statute, but it's as a description of what makes a derivative work. And the right to make a derivative work is one of the exclusive rights reserved to an author. Well, someone along the way decided that, well, really, if I'm changing the work a lot, if I'm transforming it into something else, that really should be what fair use is about. And a lot of judges agreed. So transformative use in many ways, until now, I think, maybe still, kind of swallowed the rest of the arguments, all four elements, but certainly the first one. And that's really where the court is talking. But there's three more elements, and they're supposed to matter as much or more depending on the situation. We're going to go through them quickly because we're not really talking about them tonight. Um, or we're trying not to. That's part of the interestingness of this case. The second one is the nature of the copyrighted work, so the underlying work. Um, the, and by that, we're talking about is it something that's really in the heart of copyright and gets the best protection, or is it something that's more factual or something that's less expressive? The more expressive the work, the more protection copyright gives it. The less expressive, the less. Again, there's more to that, but Meredith will hit me if I go into full lecture mode, and I'll deserve it. So there's a lot more that could be said there, but that's the gist of it. The third element is the amount and substantiality of um, the work that was used. So did I use the whole thing? Did I use a little piece of it? There is no numerical number that's okay to use. Some people think that you can use five seconds or five percent. No, th there's no numbers. It's all eh. And it also depends what you use. The Supreme Court case on that was Gerald Ford's memoirs. He wrote it shortly after he left office. And any of you who are either have studied his history or are old enough to remember around that time, when he left office, really the only thing in his really thick memoir anyone cared about was Nixon and Watergate. So of course, the lawsuit was over someone who stole that part of his book and published it. So you didn't have to buy the whole book, which no one wanted to. Um, you could just read in the mat. You could buy a magazine article and read the good part. So even though it was a very small amount, it was the good part, and that was deemed not to be a fair use, even though it was proportionally small. And then our fourth factor overlaps a little bit with the first factor, but it's really intended to look a little differently, and it used to be more distinct before we started talking about transformative stuff. The effect of the use on the potential market or value for the copyrighted work. So am I do, again, it's kind of, that's more in my mind at least, the heart of how I think of fair use. Am I really competing with and superseding the original work? If I want, you know, if I want, okay, I don't want to be unfair and use this case as the example, but is the um, potentially fair use, what I would call the infringing use, it, is the infringing use something that's really going to compete with the original work? or even in a secondary market. It doesn't mean I have to be selling it this way yet, but is it something that I could potentially want to do reasonably? Something I've not yet expanded into still counts. Fair use isn't supposed to compete with the original work. That's the bottom line. These four elements are how we get there. Sounds pretty simple. <coughs> yeah. Um, I tend to tell people who are um, who want to be artists or authors or any kind of creative folks, that in spite of what you hear, there is an inherent danger to relying on, oh, this is a fair use, I can do it. Because even if you're right, you're not really right until the judge says so. And that's at the end of the case, and my people do not work cheap. So it costs a lot of money to get to the point that you know for sure it was a fair use. Now, if you're using it in a classroom, if you're doing one of the very classic ones, you're probably fine. 
but anything else, are you willing to risk the lawsuit? That's an assessment of how much risk you can stand. I tend to be risk averse. I tend to advise my clients to be risk averse. That is somewhere where lawyers differ greatly because you can win a lot of fair use cases. You could. I think you still can. I, this, that's the rest of the panel. But um, no one knew what was going to be the result on a fair use case. I could make an excellent argument. Someone hypothetically, Meredith, could make the exact opposite argument. It would be just as good or better, and I wouldn't know which one of us was going to win, except that we're both lawyers, so we assume we will. Um, but that, I mean, it really was very hard to predict. So we were really excited that this case was actually making it to the Supreme Court and was going to be discussing fair use. Because there have been a few fair use cases that really didn't get us very far, because they were limited and didn't get at the heart of, seriously, what's the answer? Let us know how to do these four factors. What really matters? Because transformative use is not in the statute. In the pa if you just read the statute, if something is transformative, that means it's a derivative. And that means if you didn't have permission, it's an infringement. Well, that's not how it's been used. So we don't know what it's going to be. We were really hoping, or at least I was really hoping, this case would tell us. So um, again, it was kind of a strange start to the case because it was not the owner of the original work who started the fight. She said, I can't help but notice that I didn't get your check. And they said, you know, oh yeah, we're going to bury you, and proceeded to do so. So we went through the lower court cases, which we don't have to talk about because you're not lawyers and we only have an hour. Um, and we get to the Supreme Court. We're all going, OK, come on, come on, answer. Now, I am hoping that they will say transformative use is garbage. We're throwing it out and going back to the statute. I may be the only person on the planet hoping that. I can feel the looks I'm getting. Um, but they were going to tell us something. And they did. Um, to start with, if you live in the plan on the planet and occasionally look at the news, you're aware that there are some political divides on the Supreme Court and that they can't usually agree on what to order for lunch. Well, this opinion is a 7-2, so huge majority. So you know there's some people agreeing that don't often. The majority opinion written by Sotomayor is joined by Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Barrett, and Jackson. The dissent, the only two who voted against it, are Kagan and Roberts. We didn't expect that. <laughs> and there is indeed a concurring opinion, which is something lawyers really enjoy doing, saying, well, yeah, I agree, but you're not quite right. Let me, let me set that out for you. I'm a Supreme Court justice, and I'm really important, and you weren't quite right. So even though, yeah, 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 I voted for you, um, let me explain where you went wrong. That's Gorsuch and Jackson. They felt so strongly but differently that they came up with their own the same but different result. So this is not normal political arguments over um, anything. The key points from the decision are to start with, we're only discussing the first factor, purpose and character of the use. Well, that's cute, but how? Because if I have to balance everything to get to a result, it's kind of like saying, oh, look, I'm juggling my glasses case. Aren't you impressed? That counts as juggling, right? <laughs> it's sort of like balancing one element. Oh, look, it's balanced. Um, and so that's weird in itself, both because that doesn't make sense fundamentally, but also because when you discuss the first element, you start discussing the equities, if you will, what's fair and what the underlying facts are and how all of it works together. And you can't really help but bleed over into some of the other elements, as you would see if you read the case 18 times over like we have. Um, you say, well, but that's really not, they have a, they made the rule we're only talking about the first element and then had a really hard time only talking about the first element and didn't give us a whole lot of useful help because it's only the first element. Now, they, um, with respect to the purpose and character, they said, OK, this transformative thing. We have, to just, we have to talk about this. And they did. And they said that one of the kind of lines of argument that has become popular and had become somewhat successful, 
that what you need that if there's a, if there's a change in the meaning and the expression that's sufficiently transformative to make it be a fair use if you've changed the meaning if you've changed the expression that's transformative and if it's transformative it's fair now remember if you're actually reading the statute if it's transformative it's derivative but that's okay um, we've been way too far for me to sway anyone with that argument I can't help repeating it though um, so we look at the purpose and character of the use and they said well no, no no one thing that I think was at least a very good choice was they said one rabbit hole we're not going down when we talk about meaning is what the artist meant because the Warhol Foundation made the argument that the meaning behind the artistic expression of Warhol was substantially different than the meaning behind the original Goldsmith photo. Her photo apparently celebrated his fame and his celebrity and the stripped of some of the shadows and then color washed Warhol picture was a huge discussion on the fragile nature of the man behind the fame. It looks like a Warhol artwork. I mean, it's purple. I like it, but I have the soul of a lawyer. I have no artistic talent. I have no artistic heart. And traditionally in copyright jurisprudence, we always say judges should not be art critics, partially because they would suck at it, partially because they're lawyers, and lawyers really should not be arguing about the meaning of Warhol's art. Now, Goldsmith wasn't dead, Warhol was, but the Warhol Foundation wanted to argue about the meaning behind what Warhol had done. I would prefer that to be in an art theory class than in a Supreme Court argument. I really don't want judges and lawyers to have to assess the artistic meaning and merit because well, and, and we're not suited for it. And to cap it off, I think one of Warhol's, the Warhol Foundation's arguments was, of course this is like deep artistic commentary because Andy Warhol made it. Warhol. And, and Andy Warhol way. only makes deep artistic commentary. <laughs> so it's deep artistic commentary because it's a Warhol because it's deep artistic commentary. And it was this sort of tautology, of, which is like, okay, so no one other than Andy Warhol makes <laughs> deep artistic commentary under this rationale. So I'm sensing yeah. that you really enjoyed Kagan's Descent. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> a sh yeah. Huge Warhol fangirl, it turns out. Kind of embarrassingly so. So we, this is where we are with the basic takeaway on the purpose and character of use. We're not going to go into the artistic meaning. Yay. And we don't have to focus on that. But we've added a new layer. When we talk about purpose and character in the past, we would have talked about Warhol taking that photo because Vanity Fair called him and said, hey, we have th these photos. Could you make something artsy for us to use with Prince? Because he's artsy. You're artsy. Let's be artsy together. And they hired him. He, well, if I were Justice Kagan, I would tell you in great detail what he did. My version, he did art to it. And now it's colored. And he did other things. Um, if you want to know, read Kagan's descent because she goes into great detail about his genius and his procedures and everything. He made it into a color and did some other things. And... Vanity Fair said, yay, and went with that. As um, Meredith mentioned, he also made a dozen others. Usually, when we talk about fair use, we would talk about him making these colorized versions of the original photo. That's the use. He used the photo to make art with. Well, now it doesn't mean that anymore, apparently. Now it means the use of the specific print which was then used in the second Prince article. There are other Prince, at, that Prince, Prince thing. Yeah. Prince, Prince. Yeah. There are other Drink. Warhol artworks out there that he made without telling anyone. Some of them are hanging in galleries. Some of them are hanging on rich people's walls, probably all in New York. And those are not covered by this. Normally the creation of Warhol's art would be the use that he put the underlying work to. Now it's this very narrow one. This one print used in this one magazine article. So the rest of them, which I assume is why they wanted the declaratory judgment rather than writing a very small check, they didn't get it. We still don't know what the answer is there. Those might be fair use, they might not, and it may vary 
the orange one may be okay, the blue one may not be, and the purple one is the only one they paid for. So it's a weird change to purpose and character of the use. It, um, you want me to jump in? Yeah, so, um, so this, uh, I was trying to think back of how many Supreme Court fair use cases we've had uh, since like the 70s. And you can count them on two hands. Uh, I think there are six, I think. Um, if there were any others, uh, they weren't major ones. Uh, so it's a pretty big deal when cases like this come up in front of the Supreme Court because fair use has these like trickle effects across like, I mean, it's, it's, the internet could not function in a lot of ways without fair use, which is actually, I think, more of a commentary on Congress not fixing the law in the way it should and, and relying on fair use. Please give us um, some rules. <laughs> but, uh, but it's incredibly important. And so in this case, there were actually, there were like 38 briefs. In addition to the party's briefs, there were 38 other amicus briefs filed. Um, and I read every single one of them. And what was so fascinating about this, this question about transformative use is every single one of them had a different answer for what this test should look like because it's a really hard question like what uh, transformative use was introduced and i will give a little defense of transformative use um, transformative use was introduced by the supreme court in uh, 1994 in a case called campbell v acuff rose this was about um, you know the song oh pretty woman uh, well two live crew took that song and uh, redid it a little bit um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they didn't get permission, um, and it ended up in a lawsuit. And they said, no, no, this is fair use. We're making a parody here. Um, and that's where the Supreme Court introduced this idea that was um, really first talked about by a judge on the Second Circuit, Judge LaValle, um, and said, when you add um, new meaning or message uh, or a new purpose, then um, that's a, a transformative use, and that tends to weigh this first factor in, in favor of uh, fair use. And and so one of the real hard questions that that raises is like, if you're saying that you have to add something new, what are we comparing that to? Like what what was in that artist or that creator's original head? I think that's the crux of what we're talking about. And there were 38 different versions of how to answer that. Um, and what was kind of funny to me was nobody none of those briefs were what the Supreme Court did. Yeah. Um, they, they, they so there's a 39th seen. option, I guess. Well, thir 40 counting the, dis 40, the yeah. concurrence. Yeah. Um, and so, so the end result is I don't think we really have too much clarity. And really, I don't think it's changed the law of fair use all that much, except for this wrinkle that um, we were just talking about, how um, it's kind of shifted the analysis from, in cases of derivative works, like uh, the creation of um, this, this print, it shifted the analysis from, is that work uh, fair use to like, is this specific use in a licensing scenario fair use, which um, in my mind actually introduces a lot of problems for other people who may hold copies of these things. So now all of a sudden, and like museums actually filed mm -hmm. a brief in this case, and they said, hey, you know, it would be kind of a problem if we all of a sudden have to do a fair use analysis for every single um, image that's hanging on the walls of our museums because we're not sure if, you know, that thing is truly a fair use uh, based on how the original creator might have incorporated other content. Um, but that's the world we live in now, um, and we're kind of waiting to see how that uh, how that shakes out. Yeah, so there's there's kind of two different. One of the ways that I've heard it phrased, um, if you're having kind of a hard time getting your head around this, like, well, what do you mean? What are we talking about here? It's fair use as a noun versus fair use as a verb. Um, so the idea that that existed beforehand, so like say this is a, a painting, just bear with me, sorry. Um, so prior to this case, if I made a painting with, uh, I used characters from, I don't know, I, I did a painting of, of Cassian Andor. Um, I'm making something up on the fly, so cut me some slack. Um, and I did this. Uh, we would talk about whether the painting is a fair use mm -hmm. as an adjective. Is this painting a fair use of, of copyrighted material? Um, you know, and the analysis would not change if I hung it on the wall. It was a characteristic of the work. I hung it on the wall. I maybe put it up for sale in the artist gallery. I put it on my phone, uploaded it to my website. It was a characteristic of the thing that I made, whether or not it was a fair use. 
Now the Supreme Court says, no, 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 no. It's what you do with it. It is the verb, is the use you are making of that that new thing that you've just done, that new painting of Cassian Andor, are you using it fairly? Um, and in this case, the Supreme Court basically came down and said, well, you know, um, there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, one of the recurring themes in, in, if you talk to enough folks who study fair use, is that fair use really just becomes an a-hole test really quickly. Um, that if the judge looks at you and goes, hmm, Kind, kind of an a-hole, uh, then you, you don't get fair use. Um, and I think it's safe to say that the Andy Warhol Foundation fell on the other side of that line, uh, specifically because, and, and the court went just in just incredible amounts of gymnastics to say, don't, for the love of God, don't quote us on this in any other circumstance except for this one, um, which is hysterical because their entire job is to be quoted on this stuff. That's uh, why we have that's, them. That that's you had one job thing? Foundation of laws to quote them on these job. things. Um, but they basically said, look, you know, uh, this not only did, did you know, fine, he made a bunch of these other ones, but then they took one of them and literally supplanted the exact, they licensed this work to the same magazine that Goldsmith had licensed her exact same photo to for the same kind of art. Like, literally, it's just like body-checking Goldsmith's work out of the market. Um, now, if you think back to Courtney's description of the four factors, the fourth one was market displacement. And all of a sudden, that factor, which was its own little separate fourth factor, has started to creep in as an assessment in this first, what was ostensibly just a, an analysis of the first factor. So there's some concern among uh, the copyright Wong Karate here um, that they they have collapsed the first and fourth factor together. Um, now, from a policy perspective, I'm just going to do my, my piece yeah, on this, sure. which is that like I work a lot with fan communities. Like these are my people. This is like the, the world I come up from. Um, and you know, one of my favorite things is to see how people think fair use works. Um, understand and usually don't understand fair use. This goes to other lawyers. Other copyright lawyers misunderstand fair use all the time. Um, and the way that the Supreme Court phrased it, I think actually tracks people's intuition about how fair use should work a lot more closely than the actual law otherwise does. That can't be good. Um, yeah, well, and that's the thing. Like, from a policy perspective, I think it's actually a good thing um, and I'm, I'm someone in the minority of, of the copyright, copyright wonkarati uh, for saying this. Um, but this, you know, if you explain the fact pattern to them, most people will go, hmm, that kind of sucks, actually. Um, I, don't, I don't think they should get away with that. Mm. Uh, and I think bringing the law closer to what people think the law is <laughs> is generally a good thing from a policy perspective. Uh, you get a lot less sort of, you know, miscompliance and a lot fewer misconceptions about what it is. But it is, it is a... Mm, it's it's it is a very substantial shift. The Supreme Court's protestations to the contrary, notwithstanding. <laughs> we don't know how it will apply on other facts because they did make it so narrow. And these facts, as Mary was saying, are kind of like, why is this even in a trial? You paid her for this before, and the terms of the license with Vanity Fair were you can use. She had a series of photos. You can use whichever one or two of these you want. You can do one in a full page, one in a quarter page or half page, and you'll pay me this much. You have to put my name on both of them and in two other places. It's very specific about attribution, use, and payment. No one knew Warhol was just going to run with it and do what he wanted. And when Vanity Fair said, oh, let's use another one of those clever artsy things now that he's dead, they went back to Warhol because they forgot about Goldsmith. Okay, this does not make Warhol sympathetic. The poor thing deserved her money because they it was still her artwork underlying his artwork. And they just had to pay her her check. It wasn't like the Orbison case that Dave mentioned a second ago where Orbison told Two Life Crew to go pound sand because in his mind their music was filth and no, they couldn't do that. Well, the only way they could express what they wanted to express was through fair use without permission. Goldsmith wasn't saying you can't have it. I'm going to limit your expression. She was just saying, you know that little check you gave me before? I'd like another one, please. And put my name on it because this is what I do for a living. It would be difficult really from a fairness standpoint to go any way other than they did. There are yeah. there are two artists that are the bane of copyright lawyers and it is Andy Warhol <laughs> and Jeff Koons. Yeah. Um, and, 
and uh, Richard Prince. I'll take that back. Yeah, Let's make yeah. that three. Prince, prince. Prince. get another Prince in there. Another yeah, Prince. Yeah, the another other Prince. prince. We, we talked about that in the one of my unholy like, triumvirate oh my of my headaches. Princes. So you know, every every term, um, if you read like literature on how the Supreme Court handles cases, every term um, they have a handful of cases that are sort of duds. And by duds, I mean they issue an opinion and then it almost never gets cited. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I was to predict, uh, this would be pretty close to a dud, I think, um, because the the holding is so narrow. It was such an unusually bad fact pattern. And, and on this issue, too, of them only addressing the first factor, I don't know why they did this, but when they accepted the case, uh, what you do when you petition the Supreme Court to take your case is you give them a question that you want them to answer. You know, tell me, is a tomato a vegetable or a fruit, which I think is a question they've answered, right? Mm-hmm. Um Probably so in this case, they, the, the question presented was to help us figure out how to um, interpret the first factor. And so that's all they did, and I think that was a big mistake. They shouldn't have taken it on that question because it left out all the other factors that probably would have been more appropriate to answer yeah. this And remember, question. it's the Supreme Court. So when they said, oh, the only question that we're asking you is this one narrow specific one, the Supreme Court routinely says, well, you only asked this question. Right. So we're going to answer all of it. And they just say, yeah, that's nice. This is the question that we granted cert. Now we're going to answer 18 related questions. And sometimes don't get back to the narrow question. <laughs> right. yeah. They just go other places. That's what they do. The so su- for them to say, oh, we can only answer the narrow question. The Supreme Court answers the questions you it wishes you asked them. Yes. Regularly. Except um, this time when for some reason they didn't. So that is a good time to cue questions, actually, since we've got about 15 minutes. Speaking of questions you wished people had asked, um, you have to line up at the mic. I am flattering myself, maybe, by thinking there'd be a line. Um, having said that, the mic is right there. Help us out. Line up just so we feel good. There we go. Three people. You don't really have My husband's in the back. He needs to ask a question. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> he came, man. Sorry, I'm sure. Yeah. Mine's not here. Oh. Oh. He's um, heard it too many times. Feedback. Um, thoughts on why they granted cert at all if they were going to grant such a narrow <laughs> question, especially given what you've been talking about, about how unhelpful it is? So I have a theory. I don't know if it's right. but um, So the Supreme Court doesn't hear fair use cases very often. Right. Um, they heard one recently, though, that was a pretty big deal. It was Oracle v. Google. Um, this was a pretty major case about re-implementation of APIs in the Android ecosystem. You've heard about it probably. Um, And it was actually kind of a weird case for them to take on fair use. And my theory is that they were hoping that this would be a case where they could sort of course adjust a little bit um, and uh, reorient the doctrine a little bit more around creative works. Whereas that case, it really shouldn't have been a fair use case to begin with. That was more about like, are APIs copyrightable to begin with? And they couldn't quite get there. So that's my theory. And then it just like didn't work. And then something else happened. Yeah. yeah, and then they actually read the fact pattern. <laughs> but even with that fact pattern, they could have they could have given a full opinion with some clear answers. Because mm-hmm. as, I, as I was I was teaching copyright over the spring, and we kept waiting for this opinion to come down. So I may be the only person in the world who was really, really waiting because I wanted it in before the class was over so I could put it on my exam. Um, yeah, the week after exams, there's the case. So I sent it to my students. I'm sure they all opened it and read it immediately because they were as anxious as I was. It. But even if it had come down in a way that I would think would be bad for copyright law, which would have maybe continued to expand fair use to swallow all the copyrights that said, oh, because people like to steal, they should be allowed to. They could have said any nonsense like that. But even if it had been what I thought was an awful result, if they had just given us some guidance so that we would know, so we could give our clients advice of, yes, that's probably safe, or mm, no, you probably shouldn't do that, as opposed to, I don't know, flip a coin and how many lawyers do you want to hire? So I will say that they've, they've taken a handful of, of uh, so, so to zoom out, um, the last two copyright experts who sat on the Supreme Court, like justices who actually had a background in this, were Stephen Breyer and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Neither of them are on the court anymore. Um, and so I think what happens, this is my theory, which I think, I think Dave is probably correct. I th- actually, I'm going to subscribe to your newsletter now. Um, having said that, uh, I think what tends to happen is that they kind of don't appreciate often until the briefing is in just what they've stepped in. 
Um, that, that's right. That they're like, oh, well, here's a hugely complicated and annoying area of copyright law. Clearly, it is time for us and in our infinite wisdom to set it straight. Um, once in a blue moon, they'll get something like Fourth Estate, which was which is a case about registration. It was about the administrative side of registering a copyright. That was a 9-0. Just out of the park. Clear answer. Mm-hmm. Go nuts. Um, but they've also done things around like separability, which is like how if you've got something that is both kind of functional and also kind of creative how do you suss those two parts out from each other we went in with 10 tests we came out with an 11th and um, it doesn't do anything and it doesn't do anything it doesn't oh, and this happens over and over worst and over again ever. um so, so i am generally happy when they don't take copyright cases because so, <laughs> so, they are so rarely improved upon I, I, I do want to say and we'll get to the next question i i do feel like um it's important to say something about the stability of fair use because we're talking all about the supreme court like screwing up a lot of stuff and not giving us answers um there there actually is quite a bit of predictability in terms of like everyday fair uses uh and there are certainly differences of opinion in terms of how risk averse or not Mm -hmm. to be um but you know the vast majority for instance of authors authors writing like biographies where they're using an image to like illustrate something or art history people using an image and talking about it like those are actually pretty clear cases um and uh you know it's not like a super gray area um there's been some pretty good empirical research done looking at like every fair use decision that has been decided and kind of um, uh, uh, grading them and trying to assess are there patterns or not. And there actually is a lot of stability. It's really around the edges and with weird fact patterns like this that you end up with um, hard questions and, and gray areas. But for a lot of the things that people are doing, it's it's not. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Go ahead. I was wondering, I was thinking the lawyers that the photographer had to hire were probably not cheap. No. Has she actually been, after all of this pain and suffering, has she actually gotten paid by the Andy Warhol Foundation now? Or does she have to like yeah. file another yeah. suit to even get any money? Probably, now? so procedurally, usually what happens after the Supreme Court decides a case is they are reviewing the, the decision that was made at the appellate court one level below them. And usually they will decide. And because they only decided on the one factor, I believe they then kicked it back down to the appellate court. So she may not even have been So it's not even done yet. It's not done yet. It's still, it's still going. Unless yeah. Warhol Estate fin- or the foundation finally said, fine, here's a check, go away. But, yeah, but I, do- I haven't heard that that happened, which I'll- doesn't mean it didn't. But, yeah, if if they haven't done that quietly, it's back at so the still circuit. So she's still pay more money for more lawyers. And- yeah, so yeah. A, a good example of how oh this usually, God. well, not usually quite as dramatically, but the Google Oracle case went on for, no exaggeration, an entire decade. Yeah. Um, and oh. that went through, that went trial, appeal, Petition to Supreme Court, denied, back down to trial, did a second trial, went back up to appeal, went back up to the Supreme Court. COVID happened in the middle of that, which is how it hit the decade mark. Um, And then it was finally decided, but it was only decided on this one fair use question. And I think they remanded it back down, yeah. and then I think it settled they at that point. They finally just said, yeah. oh, that's it, <laughs> they, they finally were like, dear wow. God, can we go Thank home? Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, it, yeah, it goes on forever. Litigation. And there is a part of the Copyright Act where you can get attorney's fees from the other side, but it's it's actually not that easy. You have to get yeah, to the end you, of the process it, it, yeah, first. It may be at the end of all of this, not only will she get her 500 bucks, but she will also get the $9,000 or $9 million bill from <laughs> yeah, her. Um, more like it. Uh, sorry, I lost a zero in there from her attorneys because it was... Did she have a Gottlieb attorney? Someone who used to be a Gottlieb, yeah. It's, it's one of the bi- it's one of the bigger firms. Yeah, because the I did the CLE with one of them, and he knew her very well. Mm-hmm. So she's her lawyers were good, um, and you pay for it out um, of pocket. Yeah, <laughs> just a quick comment, and then my question. Uh, at the risk of bringing the art critic side back into it, one of the interesting things that just made no sense about the Warhol Foundation argument to me is they were saying that the Goldstein photo was like celebrating his fame when it was taken three years before Purple Rain, hmm. when Prince wasn't like as famous as he would become. And it was not, a, the, the shoot didn't go well. No, She no. was trying to take pictures, yeah. she was hired to take pictures of it. Mm-hmm. She, so she's taking pictures of Prince, and he walks out halfway through because Prince. Yeah. And she only <laughs> got a few pictures, she wanted more, and she said none of them really looked like what she wanted yet, yeah. because she's her own kind of artist as a photographer, and she didn't yet get the shot she wanted, but he just left. And so they were done. And she's, I, 
you know, I would be infinitely curious. She was not to know celebrating what, anything. Yeah. She was snapping quickly and hoping to capture something. Just where but, the Warhol Foundation lawyer has pulled that from. But uh, the, the actual question, though, is did any of the. Because I would expect Roberts, especially uh, in his descent, I don't know if he yeah, did, think but that. bring up the other four or the other three. Uh, parts of fair use at all or was it just completely ignored in all of their opinions well the dissent was kagan's oh, and right. she um she really likes andy warhol and if you're interested in art history <laughs> and joining the warhol fan club read the dissent because that's really all it is except for a little bit of sniping back and forth between her and sotomayor usually the dissent does explain why the majority yeah, yeah. is wrong i mean that's kind of the whole point i'm dissenting i'm objecting no you're wrong and Oddly, in this case, Sotomayor <laughs> waded right into the middle with her, and like I lost. I was going to say, oh, for one of my analysis, I'm going to count how many. I lost track, and I had to stop counting. Um, and it wasn't because I ran out of fingers. I mean, I could not count that high how many times they sniped back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Sometimes in the text, sometimes in the footnotes. But um, there was a the concurrence written by um, Gorsuch actually did a much more focused approach. He said, look to what the statute says. Mm -hmm. The statute says these things. It's, you're making it harder than it has to be. Mm -hmm. And you need all four. You need to look at the elements and mm -hmm. do it. And he focused on the first, spoke to the others as needed, said, go to the statute, use what the words mean, and look at this and say, these facts aren't that hard. He used her work in a way that he paid her for once. Now, again, there's too many parties for it to be a he. You should have paid her the second time. Why are we still here? This one isn't hard. And his concurrence is much more focused and a much better guideline, but it's not the rule. Mm -hmm. The majority is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But yeah, the dissent is its own. It is a slap fight, even by the standards of Supreme Court dissents, which can be bitter. But the, I mean, for the majority to then stoop down and slap right back was <laughs> crazy because you're like yeah i got seven votes go ahead say all you want did i say seven yeah i got seven votes you two over there say what you want and they didn't they both yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for us this is high entertainment <laughs> our standards are low lawyer nerds and we get into it it's so funny no it's really not i try to explain the humor sometimes to my husband so yeah, so I in turn can i go yeah, i'm sorry okay, cool. i'll stop so <clears throat> So in terms of yeah. for creatives in regards to the Andy Warhol versus Goldsmith case, which it does sound like it was a kind of sword and shield situation, um, what is it that each of the parties were, why is it that Goldsmith wouldn't let it go? Uh, I might have missed it. I missed the first 15 minutes of the session. So, but why is it that it was worth, like referring to the question about the millions of dollars to the attorneys, why was that something worth pursuing if it stays in that vague, not really identifiable, so concrete, and she, empirical thing. She actually was not the one to pursue it. She didn't have a choice. She, she didn't was... initiate the lawsuit. Okay. The, the Warhol Foundation sued her seeking a declarator, a declaration of non-infringement, basically. They were like, dear court, please inform this crazy lady over here that we didn't infringe right. upon her copyrights with all these things. And then that didn't work out for them. So related and, to that question, I'm sorry, I didn't actually get all sorry. the way out. You're good. You answered the first part. It was... Um, does an artist need to have a lawyer on hand in order to be ready for such a situation? Um, like, or is it going to stay kind of vague for a while? I think if, if you are reusing the entirety of someone else's work in the way that Warhol is, um, you should read this opinion. Um, but you should get you permission. Should, you, should, um, you should really understand, uh, take some time to try to understand uh, what the law is, um, even as complicated as we're making it sound. Um, and yeah, if it's like this, where you know your use case is the very same market as the person who you are taking that work from, um, yeah, that, that Based on this case, it looks like a permission scenario. I mean, there are other cases where, you know, you may be using it with some additional commentary. Um, and one of the hard things that I think this case highlights is, like, artists don't tell us the reasons why they do things very often. And if we're trying to compare the purpose of two different works and, like, no one ever told us what the purpose of them is, it's really hard. Um, so, uh, so you know, you, your mileage may vary, but uh, I think if it is really close to this fact pattern, you know, you should talk to someone who understands the law 
Um, that said, I think you know the vast majority of art gets created. I mean, you can look around this this uh, building and you see people doing all sorts of things that are kind of creative exercises of fair use and the vast majority of that does not end up in a multi-million dollar um, Supreme Court case. Thank you. Um, was I understanding correctly, were you saying that the artist's intent plays into, as, as an element of the first factor, because you mentioned that Warhol's work was considered transformative because all of it was, and the, the photographer, her work, she wasn't really happy with it. Is that, how is that coming out and how does it play into the factor system, like contemporaneous evidence or, um, and like, and how does that, <laughs> that <laughs> contribute to the analysis? That was some of the arguments that were made. And the Warhol yeah. folks tried to make a big deal out of that and a bunch of the amicus briefs did the same thing. But what the Supreme Court tells us is indeed what the traditional rule has been, which is no, we're not going there. That's not what we mean by this. We are not going to try to get into the soul of Warhol. We are not going to try to get into the soul of the photographer. And if they got one thing right, that at least, thank you. You know, We don't want to try to figure out the tortured soul of artists. That doesn't belong in the statute. So the Andy Warhol Foundation has a long history of litigation and of um, making a lot out of Warhol's work. And I'm, I work at a museum, very familiar <laughs> okay. with all of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but was there any attention paid to his history of doing artwork in a commercial setting? Um, a lot of his career was focused on commercial artwork. He knew what the fair use was um, because he was charging people to use his work in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, Which is traditional. The people who scream the loudest, my use is fair, you can't squelch my expression, are the ones who sue immediately if someone yeah, bothers no, them. He, it, was, he it, was also very flippant about the meaning of his artwork. Yeah. Right. Historically. I was about to say, he was he was very adversarial <laughs> and also was just like, it's meaningless. Like, the whole point of my art is to point that this is all commercial and I don't yeah. even make the prints in most cases. Like, I'm my, my guy who ran off to Paris and now makes some Che Guevara prints is the one who does the silk screens. Right. Um, so as much as... But he like, was dead by then, so his lawyers decided what he meant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, it made and it they had a better noble. answer than you know, it's all crap and commercial. There was a lot of irony in the fact that, that you know, Andy Warhol uh, was the standard bearer for this particular decision. Um, they could have picked someone with better history. Again, well, it's, it's the a-hole theory of... Yeah, it's the, like it's the a-hole fair use. Um, there was a fantastic, by the way, episode of, uh, uh, I think it's Ridiculous Crime, which is one of the only crime podcasts I listen to. It's what it says on the tin. It's it's 99% murder-free, 100% ridiculous, um, <laughs> is their tagline, and they hold up to it. Like uh, but they did an episode on uh, the, the Che Guevara prints, which were, uh, so the fact pattern on this was basically that, like, Warhol had this factory, and he actually did not do the silk screens himself, in, in, I think in almost all cases. He had a buddy who did them. And the he buddy... He didn't even do them? He didn't even do them. He, um... He no, he ran the. He, he ran the. He was a brand. He was more than brand than an artist. Yeah. Oh, he was um, overseeing it. Oh, yeah. overseeing it. I'm sure from his divan um, with Twiggy. Uh, <laughs> so his 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 buddy was doing the silk screen prints, and his buddy had a girlfriend, and his buddy was like, "I'm gonna follow my girlfriend to Paris." And Andy Warhol was like, "You're not my friend anymore. Goodbye. You don't appreciate art." Um, and then the buddy ran up to Paris with his girlfriend, and then six months later was out of money and was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to make some silkscreen prints that look like they're done by Andy Warhol, and then I'm going to pass them off at a museum and say that they're Andy Warhols. And so that very famous silkscreen of Che Guevara was not actually done by Andy Warhol. It was done by this buddy of his that moved off to Paris. After the fact um, is a counterfeit? Well, uh -huh. and, and the best part is he got them <laughs> placed as Warhols in an art gallery exhibit. And some visitors to said exhibit were like, I don't believe that this is a war hall. Now, in France, the art counterfeiting laws are serious business. Like, you end up in a jail cell serious business. And so the art gallery uh, director was like, you know, presumably in a French accent, I do not believe this is by Andy Warhol. Uh, and so the, the buddy called Warhol and was like, you got to help me. They're going to throw me in a jail cell. I may have done a thing and then said it was yours. Uh, and Warhol was like, fine. I will declare that they're mine. 
but you owe me all the money you make from selling them. And so the art gallery director called Andy Warhol, and Andy Warhol retroactively made them Warhols. <laughs> And said, oh yes, they are mine, but my associate was not allowed to, he was not authorized to sell them, so please send all the cash to me. Um, and so, this guy avoided jail time, and they retroactively became Andy became Warhols, Warhols, and he had nothing to do with them. And um, this is the man whose deep meaning in art we're supposed to respect for fair use. Oh my god, I did not Go that. Go listen to Ridiculous Crime, it's great. That yeah, episode is one of my favorites. It, should we send it to Kagan? <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> Okay, well, it is 9.30, right. um, so thank you everyone for coming out and geeking out with us this evening. Uh, please rate our panel on the panel app. The more high-rated panels we get, the bigger room we get next year, so give us, give us all the stars, please. <laughs>